Lelu, thanks for, uh, for joining us. Welcome to the uh, NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group meeting for uh, this quarter. All right, so um, I will begin by saying that um, this meeting, we are um, looking at discussing costs and cost estimation for redundant storage. Um, there are three of us, uh, three group members who are planning to um, present on about 10 minutes each or so uh, on a recent project. Um, but I'm also seeing that the other two folks who are going to present are not here yet. Um, so um, one being uh, Scott Prater from UW-Madison and then Martha Anderson from University of Arkansas and myself. Um, so I want to give uh, Scott and Martha a few more minutes here. But I'm happy to start us off in that discussion, uh, depending on how, how long it takes for them to get here. And if for any reason they don't show up, uh, then I would certainly welcome uh, anyone else who has a story in the uh, same, same vein to uh, see if they had um, anything they could uh, bring to the discussion. Be awesome. Okay, well, um, why don't we get started? Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. I think I see that uh, we have uh, two new members who are joining us for the first time. Uh, so just to go through a little bit of housekeeping for the meeting. Um, first off, thanks everyone for adding your name to the attendance list. Um, but it looks like uh, Rita and is it Emmeline or Emmeline? Uh, we have both both of you are joining us for the first time. Uh, I was hoping if maybe you could uh, introduce yourselves really quickly uh, to the group. That would be great if you're up for doing that. Hi, I'm Rita Johnston. Um, I'm the new head of digital initiatives at University of Miami, and my colleague invited me to come join this group. So I'm here to, to listen to everyone today. All right, great. Thanks, Rita. Welcome. Hi, I'm Emmeline Kayser. Uh, I am a new digital archivist at the University of Georgia uh, Libraries. Um, so I am also here with one of my colleagues, Adrian Hansen, and um, here to to listen to everybody and yeah, thank you for having me. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, so um, let's see, um, let me check just, okay, Scott's here now. Uh, and I'm gonna see if, uh, okay. Let's see, Martha, didn't see yet. Okay, um, so Scott, um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, at, at this point, it's you and I uh, who will be presenting um, some information about estimating uh, costs with, regarding uh, redundant storage. So um, would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? Uh, Either yeah, fine. just second. Okay, so you wanna go second? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Great. I just need to uh, kind of sum myself up here. Um, okay. If, if you like, uh, I could go ahead and um, go first. Um, I have some documentation that I uh, that I created back um, last October, and this is really a work in progress. It's not great in that it was a snapshot of a point in time, and we don't yet really have uh, systems to have both historical data and um, ongoing current data collected, but at least it's a snapshot of uh, what we're tracking. And the idea being that over time, I'll go ahead and make this more into a kind of dashboard so that I can go at any point in time, look and see how much uh, this space we're using, what the cost is, and examine historical trends and um, you know predict what, uh, how much more we'll need and what the cost will be in the future even though costs, as everybody knows, is harder to predict because they change all the time. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen now. Yeah, go for okay. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Okay, and can everybody uh, see this? Uh, this uh, Confluence Wiki page? Looks good. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so just a little bit of background on this. Um, we were asked uh, last August uh, for a grant um, if we needed to revise any of our estimates and costs. And so one of the costs was how much we expected we were going to be using in uh, disk storage for um, preservation and for digital uh, collections and whether the cost we had originally anticipated three or four years ago had changed and it had, but we didn't know how much and we didn't know why and we didn't know where. And so I spent about a week working with some of my colleagues to um, gather um, basically all of our uh, storage, um, our remote storage that we're paying for and um, calculate, you know, show how we're using it and calculate what the costs are. And so this first that I have here <clears throat> is just some links to uh, some of our shares. Basically what we have is um, <clears throat> some central IT, which is Division of Information Te Technology, do it. Central IT storage that we contract out and then we have some AWS storage uh, Glacier that we also um, use uh, brokered through our university. And so I went through all our hosts and everywhere where we're storing data and I just start classifying what data are we storing, uh, which host are we storing it on? And then, you know, each host uh, basically, you know, has a share of a remote share that is configured for it. And so these are the remote shares that we had in the third column. This is just the directory where it's mounted on the host. And then the do it volume, that's the volume on the um, central storage that gets mapped to this um, <clears throat> share over here in the third column. Then we have the type of storage. And here's where it starts to get interesting. So in this term for preservation, I wanted to know if this storage, if we're doing snapshots of it, whether we're doing backups of it, and then the price per year. And this uh, price is, includes the snapshots and backups. And then how much we were contracted allocated and how much we're actually using. The nice thing about both the central IT and with the Amazon is that we only get charged for how much we've used. We're not charged for how much um, our quota is. And so this is the used is kind of the important one here as of um, September 7th, how much we were using. <clears throat> and so once I had all this data in place, I was able to um, you know just start doing some multiplying of the amount used and the price per year and break that down into, you know, how, <clears throat> how much we're using, uh, what, it you know, what the cost would be if we just kept, didn't grow anymore. And if we did grow, you know, I could go ahead and calculate how much more our uh, costs would be. So <clears throat> I won't spend too much more time on this, just to say that for some things, we do snapshots, but we're not backing up. And you can see that if we're not backing up, the price is cheaper rather than being 350 per terabytes per year. It's just 200 uh, terabytes per year. And then there are some things down here, uh, like a processing disk where we just process data, but we don't keep anything on it. We are neither doing snapshots nor doing a backup. <clears throat> And then, you know, we have some bucket storage here, this uh, IBM uh, COS S3, that's our local bucket storage. And then you can see we have our AWS down here. <clears throat> and then finally at the end, uh, you know, our deep glacier snapshots and backups, they don't do that. And so um, it's not even applicable. And uh, finally, what I did is a description of our um, type, uh, type of data and what it's used for. And in the preservation, I talk about uh, the different uh, space allocations, shares we have. 
we have an allocation for processing, which is just basically a place where we put data, get it ready to preserve, and then moved it off. As I note, it's volatile and it's of a fixed size. You know, we don't plan on growing that unless we get a very large data set that for some reason we have to grow, and then we'll probably knock it back down. The IBM COS S3 preservation storage is our local on site preservation storage, and then the off site storage that we have is Amazon uh, uh, Deep Glacier. And finally, down here, I have the storage by type. And here I talk about the type of location and who has it. Uh, I talk if there are uh, different nodes, the two different nodes, if there are snapshots, and um, if their backups are available or not. <clears throat> and here uh, I talk about the price. And so for this do it storage, it's all the same. You get the primary storage and the snapshots for 200 terabytes a year. And then if you decide you're gonna do backups also, um, one single copy, that's 150 terabyte per terabyte per year additional. And then I just basically have some commands I use to measure usage. Because right now, believe it or not, we don't actually have a good way other than at the command line to measure what our usage is. <clears throat> And so I have this for all our different kinds of uh, storage. And here at the end, you know, I have our S3, our local S3 um, storage, no backups, no snapshots, 150 a year. And then uh, how to have a port where we can check our current usage. And then finally the Glacier Vault um, and the S3 to Glacier Preservation Storage. And so these are basically all the, um, all the raw data that we use to um, first document our um, preservation infrastructure and storage, answer questions like, do we have uh, multiple copies? Is it mirrored? Do we have backups? Are the nodes geographically dispersed? Do we have heterogeneity of, um, of uh, systems? And coming here, I can answer all that into very mind-numbing detail. And then the second purpose of this is simply to track uh, costs and storage. And I can go and do multiplication. I can look at our allocations and I can come up with numbers uh, based on these, on how much we were charged right now if we grow by X amount of terabytes of this kind of data or that kind of data, how much more do we anticipate that we would grow? So that, that's pretty much it at a high level. I'll stop talking now if anybody has any questions or comments. Yeah, let's uh, definitely open up the, the floor for, for questions. Thank you. Hi, Deb. Thanks, hi. This is really interesting. I'm wondering about the cost for the Isilon storage for, I think it was 150 per terabyte per year. What do you factor in when you come up with a number like that? That's something we've been um, debating over the years. I mean, we have some idea what our disk, our literal disk cost is, and I, I think that's what we have decided to do, but there's also the um, infrastructure of the data center and the staff that work there. And, you know, we know it's not a real dollar amount. And I just wondered how you decided to call that or what you decided to call that. Yeah, so in our institution, um, we it's kind of a weird setup in that it's a cost recovery and chargeback instant. Um, set up where we actually pay central IT for disk usage. And so for our purposes, this IBM S3 bucket looks and is charged to us just like AWS would be or you know, um, Azure or any other uh, third party provider. We don't know what goes into uh, this number that they've come up with. And um, 
sometimes we're not sure that they know either because the prices have just been kind of nutty over the past 15 years. I remember one time I was quoted a price $10,000 for some set of data. And then when I actually sat down with them and started talking the price, they said, well, no, it's going to be closer to a million dollars for that data. I was thinking 10,000 or a million, which is it? <laughs> How do you come up with these costs? Um, the past few years, especially as they're working with vendors like IBM, they've um, they've gone better at having a fairly consistent, somewhat market price. Um, but, you know, when you compare 150 terabytes per year to uh, something like uh, uh, Amazon Glacier, 12 terabytes per year, that's still a pretty big difference. And I do not know why or how they came up with that number. I do know when we ask them, they say, well, there's the cost of staff, there's the cost of disk, there's replacement costs. And I also think, um, well, I don't think I know that they are using uh, this number to also cover other operations that don't have a chargeback model. So not all this money is going just to maintaining the uh, storage. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I also see a comment from Carol here in the chat. Uh, Carol says, we use 300 terabytes a year, which includes the storage cost and some of our time, but how they came up with that number, I'm not sure the details, thought it was interesting. Uh, Wisconsin is very similar in cost. Hmm. Yeah, that's good to know too. I mean, doesn't surprise me too much because um, Minnesota, and Wisconsin talk a lot together. <laughs> and so they may have come up with uh, similar ways of uh, organizing and charging for storage. All right, do other folks have questions? Oh, Nathan. Scott, I'm wondering if um, now that you've collected this data and it's there in one place, has has anyone else had an aha moment or, oh, you know, has, has it solved other problems than what you set out to solve by actually assembling the data in this way? Thanks. Um, yeah, actually it has. So, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I work with our system administrators. Um, to gather this data. And, you know, our system administrators are a really good group. They're very responsive. And when we ask for disk space or something, we talk it through and they get it ready and allocate it for us. But what that has meant over time is that things have been, our storage infrastructure has kind of been growing and creeping organically without ever without having a kind of high level view of where everything is and what, um, what, it, what it's costing. And this is kind of compounded by the fact that um, we're built fairly irregularly from our central IT. And so we haven't, you know, it's been hard working with central IT to just kind of come up with, you know, steady monthly budgeted uh, cost. Now, Central IT has been really good where they haven't like suddenly presented us with, you know, a hundred thousand dollar bill for the past six months or something like that. You know, when, when things like that come up, we can usually work with them. But um, what this has been useful for is the system administrators are now using the same page and have created some of their own uh, with similar data and links back to this page. Um, to track not just our digital collections and preservation storage, but all the storage being in use uh, by the libraries for everything. And uh, I, we're talking, you know, the system administrators, I, a couple others, about ways to actually get this into like a Grafana dashboard and into some sort of real live time tracking 
and you know uh, data analysis tools that we can use to actually do real-time calculations of costs and projections. So it's been useful in that it was kind of a first stab of gathering a bunch of data together that never been gathered before. And they're continuing to gather that data and uh, look at it now in a holistic way beyond what we did with this. Yeah, this one actually took quite a while uh, between working with our AWS contact, central IT and our local system administrators. I wanna say it took me the better part of a month to come up with all of this. Um, not a solid month, but waiting for responses, follow-up questions, things like that. So, so I have a question, um, for you, Scott. So when it comes to, I mean, looking at uh, the page the, uh, of, that you've collected um, all this data on, it looks like a lot of this, and as you've mentioned, was uh, it, it grew organically in terms of the types of storage, um, but also that there's an advantage um, in, the, in the idea that you're paying for what you need as opposed to paying upfront for like allocations of storage at a particular pro, uh, provider. Has that discussion ever surfaced more with IT where you know you're you're saying here are the pros and cons of like prepaying upfront for say 200 terabytes of stored somewhere versus going, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, like using what you need? Like, have, have you all discussed the trade-offs there? Not yet. And mostly that's because um, they're not really open to changing the cost model right now. I mean, it was more, this is our uh, cost model. This is how we um, charge. And, um, you know, we'll discuss with you what the costs are but they haven't really talked about, you know, allocation, um, you know, charging by allocation. They do put quotas on the um, shares so that we do get alerts and we can, you know, we, we do have to ask for a quota bump in order to get um, more space if we run into our quota. And so that kind of places a natural break on um, our costs in the sense that we're not gonna suddenly be ingesting a petabyte of data and be surprised with a bill at the end of the month. That if we get a petabyte of data, we're gonna bump up against our quota. We've already calculated how much we would be charged up to the point of our quota. And at that point, we would go back to central IT and talk about, we have this much data and we, we need this much more space and what can you do for us? Okay. So yeah. yeah, there is, um, we're only charged for what we use, but there is a hard quota put in place that makes sure we don't go beyond what we anticipate we think we'll use. Right, right. Yeah, that seems like a really good policy to have in place. For yeah. 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 One, uh, one thing I want to comment out here too, and that it, um, I was even kind of surprised by it, and I was the one who came up with these, you know, storage shares and infrastructure, was the heterogeneity of the different storage shares we have, the different kinds of file system, the different costs, and the different purposes. And that's one thing, you know, if I were to go out and do like a presentation on this at NDSA, that I would start talking to um, people who are just starting out trying to figure out what their disk space needs are, is that your needs are plural and that you really need to kind of design storage around the data and the life cycle and use of that data and not just say, you know, I need a petabyte to do everything I need to do. Because, you know, as you kind of saw, we had like about, you know, 15 or 20 different storage locations on different kinds of file systems with different cost models and different backups and retentions. And each one of those has been tailored for the kind of data that is on it. And do you, do you find that... Um there are multiple systems making use of all these different storage facilities in the sense that, you know, there's no, um, or, or do you have like a few systems that are making use of a few different 
storage nodes, in other words, or storage types? Like, are it, like what does the, the array of systems look like versus the array of storage types? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's more the latter. There are a few different systems using a few different storage types. But for instance, one of the storage types we have is a fixed amount, high availability, um, no backup uh, performance storage. And that's for our processing. That's our volatile storage for our processing. Um, it tends to be more expensive because it is, you know, performant. Um, on the other hand, since it's volatile, we don't need backups on it. You know, we deliberately say anything that's stored here, you know, if you lose it, it's gone. So make sure you have another copy somewhere else if you want to keep it. Um, and we don't plan on going over our uh, our allocations because we're deleting things um, in a constant kind of churn. <clears throat> and we use that for that kind of storage for a couple of different things. We use it for our digital collections processing, and we also use it for our preservation processing. And so there are two different services, both using the same kind of storage, but we have, you know, um, we'll have them on different shares. So there is kind of a diagram you could do with some overlap and then, but really it's not that many different kinds of storage and not that many different kinds of services. Okay, All right, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, yeah, any other questions uh, for Scott? Okay. All right. Uh, if anybody thinks of anything, uh, please put it in the chat. But yeah, thank you, Scott, very much for sharing. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, okay, well, let's, uh, I'm just going to do another quick check. Um, okay, I don't see Martha. So yeah, unfortunately, it looks like she wasn't able to make it. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen and uh, walk through a couple different things as well regarding cost estimation. Um, let me do this. Uh, uh, Nathan, thank you very much for taking notes. Appreciate it. Everyone see my screen okay? Okay, so um, yeah, I think there's going to be some overlap uh, between what Scott was talking about and what I have to share as well. Um, this is uh, what I wanted to talk about is a little bit more um, with regard to estimation um, or forecasting costs uh, that have to do with a specific types of storage, and then B, in this case, a very uh, like a large collection that we have in our system and the merit preservation system, um, and trying to figure out really like where that collection is going based on historical data and um, what it means to kind of get into the nitty gritty of of you know figuring out how much we're going to be spending on S3, how much we're going to be spending on Glacier, um, and we also know. Um, in this case, in this uh, second bullet here, um, the San Diego Supercomputer Center, um, where we actually prepay for some storage there, that's a little easier to figure it out. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to walk through uh, some of this information for, uh, first off, starting with kind of a, an overview of what of the, the, the rate of deposit looks like, just a very high level of the rate of deposit in our system, um, but then kind of like digging down into a particular collection. So. Um, go ahead and move this over. So this um, <clears throat> this is a, a page that I just put together uh, at a very high level, uh, probably a couple of months ago, for um, somebody who approached me from another campus. And you see, uh, asking, you know, what is what is the overall deposit rate look like in the system, and also, um, you know, where have your costs gone over the course of time? Um, and so we, we actually have a, 
Um, I think I've, I've shared it once uh, in this group, um, maybe at the end of last year, uh, uh, where I presented on like different modes of transparency where we're trying to build uh, an, you know, kind of a, an, an administrative tool on top of our repository that provides folks with a lot of information uh, about all the different operations uh, that go on there. But um, you can see here that I've got data going back to um, 2013 um, for what was deposited in, into the system going all the way up uh, until uh, more recently. We actually, this is from two months ago, so this is this number is not accurate anymore, but um, if you just take a look at this the rate, we're, we're simply like plotting both uh, on the cloud storage for one copy. You can see how um, the slope of this curve has gone up um, over the course of time, especially in the past like year and a half. Uh, you'll see also in the storage cost uh, graph on the left here, uh, a big drop um, at about January 2020, or actually, uh, yeah, never mind. Um, this is <laughs> July 1st, 2020. Um, and that's when our storage costs actually dropped because we recon we spent a lot of time reconfiguring collections to use a different type of storage that had been made available to us, which was so, um, less costly as well. So we ended up migrating a lot off of S3 and into um, a particular kind of storage down at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, uh, Cumulo Storage. Uh, so we went from, you know, over $200 a terabyte per year down to about $70 uh, uh, per terabyte per year. Um, so you can see that's what uh, basically um, aligns up with this or precipitated this, this particular uh, decline. But on the other hand, given the amount of content we're seeing come in, uh, you know, that <laughs> we're very happy that that storage uh, technology was made available to us because it dropped costs, but we're going back up. Uh, based on the, just the sheer volume of data that's in the system. So that's just uh, kind of like a high level overview. Um, going towards uh, a specific collection. Um, so this, uh, the folks that are involved with this collection had asked me to estimate how much they might be spending on uh, storage for three different copies of uh, their data, um, you know, looking forward uh, into the next fiscal year. And of course, and go kind of beyond that if we want to as well. Um, but, you know, I just went here and created uh, a few different scenarios. You know, what happens if the amount of data in this collection doubles every year? What happens if it grows by a factor of one point, or, you know, one, one and a half or 1.25? Um, and then I, you know, we're, I'm also setting uh, a, a cost for $389 per terabyte, which is essentially uh, S3, uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center copy, and also uh, Glacier. And that's Glacier flexible because um, uh, I'm not sure exactly, maybe someone else will know exactly when Amazon started to break out. Uh, Glacier Flexible versus two other types of Glacier. And of course, there's also Glacier Deep Archive, uh, which most folks are, are uh, familiar with. So, um, but what was probably most interesting to do here uh, was this like linear regression, this, this set of calculations down at the bottom where um, I'll show you on the next spreadsheet, basically a way of taking historical data plugging it into um, a template uh, which uses um, a forecast function uh, to actually kind of take into account what was in the collection in the past, um, the rate of deposit over the past, you know, certain amount of time period and what the projection for that or the forecast for that would look like. Um, and that's, you know, it's been very interesting to use um, and, you know, trying to approximate how much money, uh, you know, this particular partner would end up spending um, you know, this year and of course next year, if the collection was growing at this rate. Um, so um, let me go ahead and switch to um, the next tab here. Um, and please stop me if, if you need more context because I've been looking at these numbers for a while and I'm probably not uh, you know, mentioning enough context. Again, this is for a specific collection, um, but I think the 
the issue that I ran into, and uh, when we look at this, especially this on the, the right hand side, it's very obvious. Um, I only had data that was so granular per year. In other words, you know, um, uh, I knew the size of the collection, uh, you know, during 2019, 2020, uh, and I can observe it growing now, uh, you know, coming into 2022. Um, however, the tooling that we have uh, that shows the you know year over year growth of the collection doesn't show month over month collect, uh, collection growth. So I couldn't go in here and say, okay, well, you know, for the first quarter of you know 2019, the collection grew by you know however many terabytes. Uh, for the second quarter, maybe that growth slowed down. For the third quarter, maybe it accelerated. Uh, we don't have that kind of granularity to look into. Um, so you'll see what I ended up doing is essentially dividing the annual growth into four equal parts. Uh, and you can see these four dots uh, for each, each set. Um, and you definitely see that growth slowed down for a little while and then accelerated up here. Um, but uh, if you, yeah, essentially if you, if you click into one of these, you can see there's this forecast function that's up here. Um, and this is a template uh, that I ended up um, discovering and making use of, um, which is specifically for use of the forecast function. Um, but what it did, did end up doing is projecting, you know, essentially how much according to this, you know, current growth uh, historically and, and, you know, up until pretty recently, uh, perhaps how much more content would be added into this particular collection over the next year, and then uh, you know, going farther out than that, in 2023, you know, how much more would be added? And I ended up, you know, transferring those numbers and essentially adding them to the number of gigabytes uh, going forward. So that was just an interesting exercise um, from the standpoint of one specific collection in our system, trying to get information about. You know, historically, what was the growth, what was deposited, um, and then kind of plugging that into a template to do some forecasting uh, going forward. Um, what has actually kind of, uh, you know, had us talking recently with regard to this collection is that there's been a desire to um, move uh, or provide another copy for this collection in Amazon Glacier, but not on the West Coast, but on the East Coast instead. Um, so we've gone back and we've just used, uh, you know, used Amazon's calculator to figure out, you know, what's that going to look like, um, you know, for specifically for instead of making a third copy out here in the West Coast, uh, if we were to put it um, back East, uh, say in uh, the US East Ohio or, um, uh, any of the, you know, anything that's right, the US East one or US East two, I think, uh, data centers. So, you know, this, this is what's interesting. Like this, this page, of course, is very easy to digest. You can go and take a look. Okay, Glacier Instant Retrieval, Glacier Flexible Retrieval, which is what we're used to using. Um, you know, it's, if you look at this number right here, it's $3 and 60 cents per, per terabyte per month, and you multiply that times 12, um, that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Um, but uh, what we, we didn't trust ourselves to actually use this calculator um, that AWS has out there and uh, that's made available. And that's, that's where it really got interesting. Um, my Zoom controls out of the way here. So this particular calculator lets you take into consideration, um, you know, which storage you're going to be using. Um, and the, you have to kind of preface the conversation or the thought of like using this calculator with what you really want to do. Um, in our case, what we wanted to do was find out how much it would cost to move a collection uh, that's about 65 terabytes um, from our S3 and replicate it into Glacier. And so what that really means is that there's a process that happens there. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if other folks are 
familiar with this process as well, uh, because it's always been something I've, I've kind of talked about with other people at a high level, but I've never actually gone through this calculation process. We were actually sitting down with our, our AWS uh, uh, account rep to go through this, uh, and he was walking us through it. But um, there's a point in time where you make the deposit that is geared for Glacier, but it sits in an S3 bucket initially. And then there's a life cycle process that takes place at a time where you tell it to take place, say after one week, the you know, or two weeks of sitting there in the glacier, I mean, I'm sorry, in the S3 bucket, you want that to actually move into glacier. Um, and that's what we did. We wanted to, you know, in the course of this replication of glacier, uh, move everything to S3s, have it sit there for two weeks, um, because, you know, part of that is going to be uh, just making sure everything is there and doing any fixie checking and any of that sort of thing. And then we set the bucket to move everything to Glacier after that. So if you look at these, um, at the calculation here, first, first off, we're starting with the U.S. West in the region of Oregon. You know, we're in, in Oregon, which is where all of our servers are, uh, in addition to our S3 buckets. And... Now, I mentioned 65 terabytes, but I'm putting 32 and a half here. One thing, um, you know, the AWS rep told us about was that, okay, well, you, you know, you're thinking about putting this content into S3 for half the month and then making it move to Glacier after that. So you're actually, to make a more accurate calculation, you plug in half the actual, you know, uh, data that you're going to be, you know, estimating. It's like it's like saying, okay, well, the data, all the data is going to be here, but then you divide it in half because you're you're doing half the month here, half the month there. That's the way he suggested to do it. Um, and it runs through all these these calculations. Uh, and I have looked at these, um, but I don't think we have time to go through them. And I wouldn't. And I'm definitely not an expert on this, so I'm not going to run through them. Um, but you can see that to have all of our content for half the month in S3 will be running us $765. Um, then if you move on to Glacier um, and you do that same kind of calculation and applying a kind of an, the average object size, which actually in this case doesn't really matter all that much. It's a very, very minimal charge because we're talking about operations against that. Um, you're going to be looking at $121 uh, for that. Um, and then um, the, the kicker, though, is that um, if you look at data transfer and um, you end up choosing all other regions, in other words, not Oregon, that data transfer fee turns into uh, essentially two cents per gigabyte. And that is where the majority of this replication cost uh, comes up, which is $1,300. So um, total, you're looking around, you know, around $2,200, almost $2,300 to make this replication happen. And then in the subsequent month, when everything, all you know, 65 terabytes are sitting in Glacier, then you know you can kind of look at the Glacier charge and say, okay. Well, it's probably going to be $242 or $250 to keep that in Glacier. Um, there are lots of other small things that kind of like work into this, um, where it's, it's suddenly saying, you know, it's, it's calculating exactly at 10, 24 gigabytes in a terabyte, you know, how many gigabytes and all that. Um, it's talking about glacier storage overhead, the number of items, all this sort of thing. Um, this is really interesting to walk through if you have a subject matter expert, like going through and telling you exactly what all of this is, but um, you can also see that some of these charges are, are very, very minimal versus the actual, like, when you get down to the data transfer charge. Um, so that, um, and I see uh, Nathan mentioned decimal versus binary notation is very important for storage analysis. Yeah. Um, and, and it is definitely interesting to kind of go in here and see how all of that's being calculated. Um, but I'm, I'm going to stop there because this was a very recent conversation. Um, and so it's kind of opened our eyes to the fact that, OK, uh, we are suggesting to this partner that we want to move everything to a different geographic location. 
on the East Coast. So they want their we want their third copy to be you know geographically separate uh, in terms of risk mitigation. Um, and we can tell them that if you do that, you're going to experience you know a little over thirteen hundred dollars for this initial replication effort that you wouldn't necessarily see if you kept everything on the West Coast and you didn't have the data transfer fee kick in. Um, so that that was uh, you know just a very interesting conversation to have and be able being able to to kind of uh, get to the point where we're telling them you know these are the numbers you're looking at you have the information to make a decision on and this is what we're suggesting in terms of you know a preservation approach to do then you know and basically the ball is in their court now and we're waiting to hear back but um, it's you know I kind of see this exercise as something that's definitely going to happen again in the future um, thought it'd be interesting to share um, but also kind of prefacing that with you know here's where the collection has been and come along and where it might go in the future um, kind of taking that in, into consideration as well um, so okay yeah i'll stop there that's what i had to uh, uh to share and see if anybody has any questions Hey, Scott. Yeah, so I'm uh, wondering, have you had a chance yet uh, with the projections, uh, either kind of the overall projections or the AWS specific ones to uh, test them to see if the projected amounts actually are in line with what you eventually get charged? Um, or, you know, do a kind of uh, linear regression on past data and see how closely it maps to what you actually had uh, budgeted as costs? Yeah, that's that is um, that's a really good point and something that we that I would love to have time to do. Um, and it's been you know since we've talked to these discussions that have in, involved three different groups: our IT department, of course, and then the partner we're talking about, uh, and our team. So, um, I. You know, I think we have enough data to scrape between, you know, the costs that because because the cost centers that are involved or the different budgets that are involved, um, there are three different ones. And um, interestingly, uh, the data transfer fees would be would be hitting our like one account would be hitting this, you know, like our IT department's account because it's coming out of our S3 bucket going into another S3 bucket that's owned by somebody else. Um, so we need to take into consideration those numbers, we need to take into consideration the storage um, that you know, we're seeing that we can try to calculate and then the past numbers and kind of put all those together and see how closely everything aligns. I think it's gonna be the effort of, of digging up the historic data on on the IT department side saying can we see you know everything that you saw in terms of s3 uh, storage costs on a month like month over month um, time period can we find all that data um, and I'm I'm pretty sure we I'm, I'm sure we could it's just uh, it's whether or not we can we can find the time to make that happen but I think it'd be a very a very important part of this whole exercise is to actually go back and see how accurate some of this um some of this this work is actually you know are the figures that are coming out of it are they actually accurate or are they kind of off or um yeah like how well are we doing with this um it'd be a really good way to kind of put your finger on the pulse of that Hey, Stephen. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask uh, Eric and uh, and Scott both, um, what kind of a rounding factor? I'm assuming that you took what you think the actual price is, and it, you've rounded it up slightly um, in terms of the price that you're quoting back for your internal recharge purposes. Uh, you know, just because we know it's it's hard to get this all right. I'm wondering what kind of a rounding factor you've used.
Um, Scott, do you want to comment on that? Well, yeah, it'll be very brief and short that <laughs> in this particular one where we were um, doing a, uh, you know, a budget estimation uh, for a grant, um, I don't remember what, you know, what the bounds were, but we did a pretty substantial rounding factor just to make sure we had enough headroom on it. Um, I want to say... Yeah, I, I can't even remember, but, you know, it was maybe like on the order of 10% or more uh, rounding factor. I think that if we were to do, uh, if we were to do, you know, more projections on this for internal purposes on a regular basis, I would probably try to do something like Eric was is describing where look at uh, past numbers, see, what our estimates were compared to uh, what actual costs were, and then use that to determine some kind of rounding factor. We're moving to, to a whole new set of service providers and we're, we rounded everything up by uh, 20%, um, just because we're really unsure. We don't have any you know, history yet. Um, it'll all go into effect in about another month and a half. Um, and we realized that politically, you know, you could always lower your price, but it's really hard to raise it. So we wanted to make sure we were purposely conservative from the beginning. Yeah, that sounds about right. It's sort of our thinking too. And 20, 30% sounds like, I know when I'm doing time estimations, I always add 30% onto whatever I think it'll take to do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's as far as uh, what we've been doing, it's more along the ten percent lines, um, which I think is probably not conserv definitely not conservative enough. Um, but it, this is also a partner we've worked with for a while. On the other hand, um, the, uh, two two different things kind of rolled into that. Um, one being that one of the three storage types that we're using down at San Diego Supercomputer Center uh, is, it, is storage that we actually prepay for, whereas the S3 and the Glacier are, you know, we're paying as we go. Um, with, the, um, with the prepaid storage at SCSC, uh, you know, we can pretty much home in on, you know, exactly what, how much that's going to be per terabyte based on the number of terabytes that we're getting from them. Um, it's a 200 terabyte allocation. Actually, that's a 300 terabyte allocation now. Um, and, you know, that's set out at the very beginning. Um, but, uh, yeah, just adding up what we think uh, the S3 and the Glacier cost will turn out to be, I think we should really be doing more like a 15 or 20 percent like rounding factor. Um, and it's a good point to go back and talk more about that. Uh, okay, so let's see. Any other any other questions out there? We're, we're actually at five of the hour. I didn't realize that. Um, thanks everyone so far. Uh, but yeah, let me uh, just open it up for one more round of questions in case there are any out there. All right. Okay. Well. Um, Thank you again, Scott. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And um, uh, just a quick reminder that we do have uh, a Slack channel that's out there um, that if folks think of any other questions or if they'd like to uh, bring up any other topics, um, you know, by all means in between our, our meetings since they're quarterly, uh, go ahead and um, you know, feel free to jump on Slack uh, and uh, it'd be great to start some discussions there. Um, so we will, our next meeting is going to be, I believe on June 27th or 28th, uh, whichever that Monday is, uh, and we'll be definitely in touch, uh, over the course of time between now and then in terms of the, the topic, I think we've, uh, we're settling on what that is and we'll, uh, both Robin and I will send out an email, uh, pretty soon, but, um, I just want to see if folks, okay. Okay, um, just a couple more comments in the comment section. Okay, all right. Um, 
and Martha, no worries. Uh, we can we can circle back next time. Um, thanks for joining us, everybody, and uh, we'll see you uh, in a short while. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Take care.